Andre, welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast, mate. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be on. Mate, I've, uh, I've been having to think about what I wanted to chat about in, in today's chat since, um, since we linked up, linked up last week and agreed to do the episode. It's the first time I've had a, uh, a V8 driver on the, on the show. And in fact, I think pretty much any um, you know, racing car driver at all. So there's heaps I want to get through. <laughs> Firstly, mate, what's the, um, what is the process for, for someone that is a junior that has the ambition to make it to, say, racing in the V8 supercars at some point? in their career what is that process because i think a lot of people listening probably are familiar with the process of becoming say an afl footballer or a basketballer or whatever it may be but um when i think about a, a v8 supercar driver i have no idea what that kind of pathway looks like so what does that look like for you and, and for someone that is wanting to um, follow that that career path yeah it's a bit different as you said it's not really nothing's really explained out so um, in motorsport, there's not like AFL where you have all these different grades, I guess, and it's all, you know, this is the progression you take. So it's actually a, a big problem or a big issue in our sport at the moment that there's, you know, not any clear path. There actually used to be, but um, there's almost two at the moment that's diluted it a lot. So for a young kid, yeah, it's confusing, I guess, where to start. There's um, obviously you have things like go-karts and stuff that you start out at and you can do your local kart days and stuff like that. And then there's obviously progressions from there. But um, <clears throat> to the first get introduced to motorsport, um, CAMS Australia have pro a couple of programs. Um, if you're a young girl and you want to get involved, there's a program called Girls on Track. Um, and you go along, learn about the activities, learn about motorsport, some of the aspects of it, and just get interested in it that way. And then also we have the um, Ricardo Races, which is another young um, program for um, young guys and girls um, to get them introduced in, in racing. That's more of a driving thing. But yeah, um, we're, CAMS and um, you know everyone affiliated is really trying to put together a proper program for that. Um, but yeah, basically everyone, everyone would start out in go-karts. That's where you have your, all your foundations. That's where you learn to, you know, punch people off or, you know, how to, <laughs> how to control a car and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So it goes from there and then it progresses up through the various different categories. And starting out, was it just a hobby for you, or were you pretty set on on this becoming your career? Was it was it a goal of yours to be a professional race car driver? I know, um, you know, f you know, for for your age, you were, you're a professional quite early, and, and you come up the ranks quite well. And um, you did start with karting yourself, didn't you? Yeah. So for yeah. me, it's actually something fun I wanted to do with my dad. So it was never actually yep. something where we're like, okay, we're going to go and become you know a supercar driver or yeah. anything like that. Because my parents split up when I was quite young, so yeah. it was just something to do to spend time with my dad, to you know that father son time. You know, you either play golf or you go play football. For us, it was to go go karting, so we didn't actually take it that seriously. Um, and in the go karting years, we only probably did one event a month, if that. Um, so it was very minimal compared to what a lot of people do. And then it just naturally grew from there. We went arrived in that, and then we stepped up to the next level. Um, and my dad was actually racing at that same time at those events. So okay. I went along, and uh, all through my childhood, I'd been to his race meetings. He wasn't, you know, very amazing or anything. <laughs> he uh, just did it for a hobby. And um, I sort of grew up around that and thought, okay, well, I might as well race at the same meetings as my dad to make it easier. And um, yeah, just started out in some little open wheeler type cars. And again, until I was probably, I'd say, 13 or 14, um, it was really just a hobby. We never I thought we were big fans of people like Mark Scaife, Greg Murphy, all those you know, hero guys, Craig Lowndes. I used to go to the tracks and watch them as a young kid. So, um, yeah, it was something that, um, you know, was seemed like a far-fetched dream, I guess, you know, yeah. especially from New Zealand, you know. We didn't have many supercar drivers. We had one, Greg Murphy, at the time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how some things work out. Was there a point in time where that, that mentality changed for you, where you, you, you flicked that switch and you decided, yeah, fucking oath, I want, I want this to happen? And, and maybe it was a point in time where you got an opportunity, which up until that point you probably didn't think may have come up. Was there, was there a moment that it all changed? Um, yeah, 100%. So I obviously was from New Zealand, racing in New Zealand, and had relative success there. But, you know, when you're having that success, we still didn't think, okay, we're going to go to Australia. We're going to go through this sort of process and get into supercars. Mm -hmm. um, so I was actually preparing to race in New Zealand. We didn't really inquire much into Australia because it was so expensive to come over and race. And um, a guy called David John, who runs TKR, Team Kiwi New Zealand, um, who was in supercars many years ago, um, approached us and said, hey, we want to put a program together to race in the 
Porsche Korea Cup, which is a series over here in Australia, yeah. and um, we'll cover most of it if you can bring this amount. And so we thought, oh, like you'd be silly not to. So we jumped at that opportunity, and um, it just flowed on from there. And then next year, we got another opportunity that was, you know, very highly discounted um, by another person in the feeder series of supercars, and it just sort of flew from there. So yeah, it's funny how things work. Sometimes, you know, well, particularly for us, it's it's not something that was 100% meant to happen. We obviously would have, you know, mm. been, been very happy and wanted to go to supercars, but it wasn't something from day one that we initially thought. And sometimes I guess that works with a lot of things. You get an opportunity and open your eyes. Um, and, you know, if you perform well, then you can take the right steps from there. Bloody oath. And you mentioned then about the cost of coming to race in Australia. Is that something that you would think probably holds a lot of maybe juniors back from getting bigger opportunities? It's just the fact that financially it's such a big commitment. And and what does that look like as a driver? Like when you go to a team, is it funded by the team or as a, um, are you and your family having to fund your way all the way up until you reach that professional ranks? How does that work? Yeah, unfortunately, it's um, it's not quite like playing footy. You can't go to a rebel sport and buy a ball and then go kick it in the park. Yeah, so yeah. Anytime, anytime you drive, anything, it costs a lot of money. So it's just the nature of the sport, unfortunately. And I think the world hasn't seen some of the best drivers but, um, because of that fact, you know, because you need that sort of money to, to get across. But yeah, definitely, I'll probably say, you know, um, you'd probably need somewhere in the neighbourhood from woe to go from when you first start racing to to get professional it's um how long's a piece of string but anywhere from you know two to four million dollars um just wow. to chuck it over that time if not more depending on how quickly you're able to make the progression so unfortunately yeah that's a bit of a ha- bit of a hamstring but um you know opportunities do happen Pe- do people who don't have money do get opportunities so mm. it's not to stop you getting into the sport and it's very enjoyable of course even if you just stay at those lower levels and get involved in club day stuff, it's a bit of a community like all yeah. sport. And, um, yeah, it's a challenge. It's a different challenge to a few other sports, um, you know, because it's quite dynamic. You know, there's so many variables that are out of your control. Um, you know, yeah. you're not 20 other dickheads on the, on the track with you <laughs> that yeah. all want to win as well. So, um, yeah, it makes it very interesting. Yeah, like I, I myself am, am really... Um interested in, in you know the v8s the f1s even things like supercross and motocross and stuff and it's funny like you hit the nail on the head i think you hear from any of the the big stars in both in all motorsports it tends to be the story is you know coming up as a junior the family are putting in absolutely everything they can just to give them the opportunity which probably makes it all that sweeter once you do reach the pro ranks um but when, once you kind of made it into i guess the, the the v8 supercars and maybe had your first contract and stuff like that you know, often when talking to other athletes in, in team sports or even individual sports, once you reach the pros, that's when the, the real work starts. So what was what was the change in, say, like your weekly routine like once you made it to the professional um, ranks as a V8 supercar driver compared to previous when you were probably, uh, I don't know what your situation yeah. was, but maybe you were still working a job or something like that up until that point. So what does that look like for you? Yeah, so it's a very interesting <laughs> be in the V8 supercars, um, but you can actually not be earning any money. So um, I came into supercars very young when I was 18. Um, so I moved um, to Australia when I was in 2013, I think. So when I was 16 or 17, so, so very young. Um, and throughout that time in Australia, I was working a full-time job. In 2015, I got my first big shot. Um, and that, that year, I actually got paid enough to not do anything other than just drive. Um, mm-hmm. But unfortunately, that, that whole program didn't go um, as it should. Unfortunately, a guy that uh, ran it got cancer and passed away. So that was very unfortunate. And that sort of brought an end to that. Um, and then that following year, I did one more year, but it was with the back market team and um, there was no income from that. So I had to go get a job, um, you know, at um, a finance company. So just, you know, shuffling paper and doing all that sort of stuff. So I, uh, throughout that time, um, you know, it, it was pretty hard to, to um, you know, make it all work because you have the amount of training and stuff you have to do. So I was yeah. getting up, you know, four o'clock in the morning, a lot of days, training for a couple of hours and going to work at 7.30, then finishing at 5.30, then training, you know, again that later that evening, we'll get home till 8.30, then just go to sleep and do the same thing. So, um, you know, I still have nightmares about that year. Just, <laughs> you know, yeah, you had to put everything else on hold and just, um, you know, do what you do, could to survive. And that's unfortunately how it is. And, 
you know, it, it, it takes a while to establish yourself and um, to get yourself in a good team. And um, luckily now um, I've been able to, you know, push myself away from having to do, let's say, a, a full-time job outside of supercars. Um, yeah. So it's become a lot more demanding supercars itself. So from my day-to-day stuff, we, we have stuff like this, media equipment, um, flying normally all around Australia to do promotional stuff for sponsors. And then, of course, um, you know, you've got to invest in your health and fitness. Some people do, some people don't. I choose to do a lot of it. Um, so my days are normally filled um, with doing that or going to the workshop and talking to the boys, um, analysing data, working out where we can go faster, where we can improve, all that sort of stuff. So there's a, yeah, a bit of a, a progression. Um, it's not all, you know, sunshine and roses when you get in. Um, unfortunately, mm. even if you're in supercars, it's a hard slog. And I'm very lucky to be at that point now where I, you know, I only focus on thing and it's um, and not like any other sports I guess if you're an AFL you're generally paid as far as I can assume a, a minimum wage if not, not if not more um, like if, if when you first come in so you're sort of covered on that front but um, yeah it's, it's a bit unique like that yeah so a couple of things um, out of that so firstly you mentioned so what so your first couple of years or, or um, one of the programs you're in you were racing um, each weekend or each round but getting no income yeah, yeah. So Fuck. there, and I had, and at that point, we had to bring money to the team to help fund that. Shit. So we had to find sponsorship. We uh, had my manager and me at the time were flying all over Australia trying to get you know get people to sponsor us and get their name on the car and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's not only you don't get any money out of it. Yeah. Um, you have to try and some to the whole program. So it's Put pretty good. It. Yeah. And um, and so from what you were saying there, um the takeaway for me was so it sounds like even now and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like even now, like it's very up to you how much work you do put in. So is there a certain amount of time commitment that each driver needs to be with, with the team each day or each week, or is it kind of on you to put in that effort to go in and spend time with the team to go and look at your lap times, to go in and look at where you need to improve and go to the gym or do your physical conditioning. And is that how it kind of is? Um, it's very unregulated, so it's not like yeah. not like AFL where you have your structure. You know, mm. okay, you're going to go do this, 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 and now, and we expect you to perform at these different levels, and we're going to look after you, look after your physio, all that stuff. So that's nothing like that in motorsport. So in motorsport, you know, um, the team really only control when you turn up at the track. So um, your preparation um, physically is a hundred percent up to you. The team don't help you do any of that um, normally. Um, your nutrition's the same. Um, your Anything basically to do with your health is um, your sort of um, own responsibility. But um, with some of the stuff at the at the workshop, um, that we do have set meetings that you have to go to and stuff like that. But yeah. yeah, I guess to answer your question, I'm extremely busy, but I could be extremely not busy <laughs> yeah. if I choose to. So um, it's just a choice. Some people, you know, they don't do hardly any exercise. They don't put that effort in. Um, and I'm sure they've got a lot of spare time for other things, but um, you know, you got to invest in what you do and put a lot of effort in. I feel. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's kind of a a good thing for you knowing that you know if you want to if you want to see the results and you want to be at the the top of the, the ranks as often as possible, then it's up to you. And there's probably like you said, there's probably plenty of drivers out there that aren't putting in that work. So I mean, it's a it's a bonus, I guess, in in some respect. But I suppose there's weeks where you probably can't be fucked, and uh, it's a bit harder to go and do it all yourself. Um, but talk to me through, uh, through kind of like what it looks like for you from the moment you, you arrive at the track for a race weekend, like each day, like maybe there's practice qualifying, whatever, um, race day. How does that look for you? And for someone that has no idea about what it would be like for a driver, um, what's like the commitment like for you over a race weekend? Um, so it sort of varies. Some events are three, four days long, sometimes five by the time you arrive and you set up and you do all that sort of stuff. But normally it's three to four days. So normally we'd arrive um, the day before. So we'd normally arrive on a Wednesday or Thursday, let's say. Um, and then on the, the, if we arrived you know, early Thursday morning, we'd get to the track, would maybe chuck us up at the hotel room and then would go walk around the track. So you basically walk around the track with all your engineers and your other teammates. So get an idea of what's changed, look at the curbs, look at the surface, look for anything that might catch you out because when you're traveling in a car, you can't really 
towers, you know, at that speed. So, mm. and then throughout the day, we have meetings, we have media commitments, we have to visit sometimes dealership, like car dealerships, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's actually quite busy quite often. Um, and then obviously, once that day is done, that's that's most of your media commitments done as far as that goes. And then you get into the racing. So normally you'd have three sessions a day around that. Um, and around that, you have other media commitments, going to corporate boxes, mm. uh, interviews, stuff like that. Um, and, and with our sport, it's so money driven, you know, to, to run one car for a year costs, um, you know, three million, four million dollars. So to, to be able to raise the funds, you need to be able to be marketable and, um, you know, be involved in that side of it. So you yeah. can't, it's not. It's not like a lot of other sports. Most sport is really the only sport in the world that we can be sitting on the grid, right? And we're about to start one of the biggest races in the world or in, in our calendar. And, um, you know, someone with a camera and a microphone can come up and shove it up in your face and say, oh, Andre, you know, you set this up last time. Um, you know, are you going to be all right? <laughs> so um, it's very different as far as that goes. Uh, but there's all sorts of meetings as well over the weekend. Um, you obviously have your nutrition side, you need to keep over it, your warm-ups, your cool-downs, all sorts mm. of stuff. So it's quite it's quite busy. It's not just, you know, rocking up and, you know, in your Gucci's and you're in the hop in the car, <laughs> cut, cut some laps and, you know, just hope it all goes well. There's a lot of um, a lot of preparation that goes into it. Yeah, right. And speaking of preparation, uh, you mentioned before, like you're pretty pretty on to your nutrition and, um, and your training. And obviously we've got a mutual friend in Jaron, um, so obviously you're, you're right into it with your supplementation, everything as well. What's, what's your week look like? Um, let's say maybe throughout the off season, cause obviously, I mean, during the, the racing season, it probably is a bit different, but throughout the off season, what's your physical prep look like in terms of conditioning and strength work, but also what's your, I guess, approach to nutrition at the moment? Yeah. So the off season for me, you know, a lot of people, they go blow out, they go, have you know parties and do that stuff and I, I, I of course do a bit of that but I use it as time to prepare I feel like um, you know it's it's the largest block of time that we're actually home and I can be consistent and as we all know with training and your nutrition and everything consistency is key so for me um, on those off season I'd probably average um, 15 sessions a week whether that's training recovery um, stuff like that so in my week-to-week stuff, even now, I do a lot of riding. Um, I do a lot of riding in altitude chambers, yeah. um, so <clears throat> just with the oxygen being a bit thinner. Um, do a lot of recovery stuff. So we do yoga. Um, I do Pilates, um, like sports massage, hyperbaric chambers. So obviously pressure it up. Um, and with your, your um, whatever it is, 97% oxygen. Then chirotherapy chambers. Um, I have my own sauna in my apartment here that I that I do most days for 10, 15 minutes with yep. uh, um, infrared red light um, system I have also. So there's so many different things you, you can do. So in the off season, I just tend to smash all that sort of stuff along with all the obvious weight training um, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's, it's pretty busy, but um, I think... I personally need to always be busy. I'd be bloody so bored if I was just sitting on my bum doing nothing for three months. So you've got to sink your teeth into something. And um, obviously all the, the swift supplements um, feed into that. So all the hydrolyte stuff, yep. the, you know, vegan protein, stuff like that. And, um, you know, we, you know I, I, unfortunately, I'm not the best cook in the world. <laughs> so, <Same here. laughs> and I don't have a cooker at the moment, so um, they can't cook for me. So I have to get... Um, you foods so yeah. i'm like i smash them so they're normally a pretty ba- balanced diet um, a- as a whole so i basically smash probably four of them a day um along with all other stuff so yeah there's um lots of different stuff to do with it and then also we have a simulator well i have a simulator in the other room there that, um, i use um during the off season or even during the season to um, keep myself sharp and race against other people online yeah i was going to ask that so obviously you think of um any other sport that's used basketball, for example, over the off season, you know, players are, are getting up, you know, hundreds of thousands of shots um, each week in preparation for, for coming back into preseason and even the season and just working on, on the skills of the game. Is, is, the, is it pretty limited for you guys? Like I'm assuming you can't just go and jump in the car that you race on the weekends and cut some laps. Um, so, so is that difficult to spend the whole off season where you, you could, I guess, potentially be, be becoming a better driver to pretty much not being in the car at all 
Because I'm assuming it's quite different being on a simulator than what it is jumping in the car. Yeah, well, to go do a test day to get the idea it costs probably thirty-five thousand dollars to do one day in a car. So, um, and it's limited. So, yeah, in the off season, if you don't race in any other category, which um, I always try and do. So, obviously, from New Zealand, okay. there's, we actually race in New Zealand in the off season. Yeah. So, um, uh, sometimes I try and go do some stuff over there. But yeah, a hundred percent, it's it's not the best sport as far as that goes because we can be out of the car for four months. We have one test day, um, and then you're straight into a meeting and. Um, you know, between all the rounds, sometimes we're going to have a month break and you don't drive the car at all in those month breaks. You only drive when you rock up to the next meeting. You'll probably have two half-hour practice sessions and then you're straight into the racing. So, it, yeah, it's just something you, you get used to over time. But, um, yeah, it's probably one of the downfalls, I guess, of the sport. It's hard to get good. It takes a long time to get good because, you, yeah, you can't just go, you know, go over to the oval over there and just start kicking a ball mm. around. Yeah, fuck, I'm no good driving the supermarket after a couple of days out of the car. Um, <laughs> just one, one last little bit before we move on to a bit of mindset stuff with the physical side of things. Yeah. For those that are listening at the moment, probably, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are probably thinking that after hearing how much effort you put in with the physical prep throughout the off season, I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't understand how physically demanding it is in the car on a race day and probably asking why you have to do so much physical prep to sit in the car. So what can you give us an idea of, say, even something as simple as like a rough idea of calorie, calorie expenditure yeah. on, a, on a race day um, and why the physical prep is so important? Yeah, I do have all the information on that stuff. I don't have it in front of me, but um, it's not like driving, you know, so a lot of people say, oh, I drive a car 45 minutes to work. <laughs> it's <laughs> completely different to that. So our cars are very stripped out for a start um, and they're very hot. So um, they're normally 20 to 25 degrees above ambient. So if it's 30 degrees outside, it can be, you know, 50 or, or 55 inside. So yeah. the, heat, the heat alone is a big thing. So that's why I do a lot of sauna work. So you're trying to acclimatize yourself to that. Um, mm -hmm. And then along with the heat stress, you obviously have the concentration side of it. So it's 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 not like footy or something where you, you do a play and then you're okay, you reset and you get five yeah, a minute or whatever i don't know like 30 seconds to think yeah. about it you're always on for up to an hour sometimes two hours there's no rest uh, rest you're sort of obviously doing something extremely high risk traveling at higher speeds um and you've got millions of decisions to make per second so um it's quite mentally fatiguing as far as that goes and then to add on top of that we don't have the same power assist as you have in a normal car. So if you've ever gone down the road, I don't suggest doing this, um, but turning your engine up and trying to steer your car, you know how your steering goes very heavy. Yeah. Ours is as heavy as that, but it's a very similar feeling. So, sure. um, and for example, the brake pedal, we, we have to push about 80 kgs of force through the brake pedal on each application. And you think of that eight, eight to 10 corners or, or 12 corners um, a lap and you do 50 laps. There's a lot of applications of the of the pedal, and then we have the scare stick that we have to pull back, and that's um, you know quite weighty as well. It's not like a, a, a small little lever that you can do with your pinky. So yeah, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of things, but um, it's yeah, I can't remember the analogy. Someone explained it very well once, but yeah, all the things combined make it extremely exhausting. So you probably lose about three kgs per per race if, um, and, you know through a longer race. Mm. Um, that gives you a bit of an idea. So, yeah, it's um, not quite as easy as, as <laughs> some people think. That didn't make the hydration side of things quite big. Like, I, I, so, I mean, um, I, I watch a fair bit of the F1s and I'm assuming it's similar in, in the V8s. Like, do you have to weigh in pre and post race just to see how much you need to re rehydrate and stuff like that? Well, ideally you would, yeah. A lot of people don't. Um, I do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it's very interesting. It's It's... Hydration is a very important part of it. Sometimes I've been driving. I was driving on the Gold Coast racing, of course, and um, I started to get cramps all through my forearm and um, I just, because I didn't hydrate enough. So yeah. and that's not ideal because not your hands oh, yeah. are the main holders of the car. So um, yeah, you can get in some big trouble if you don't do that. You can obviously get heat, heat exhaustion, which is very um, deadly, of mm. course. And we obviously have the fumes and stuff inside the car so it's not very good oxygen in there as well so yeah there's so many different factors that i guess play in it so very unique as far as that goes how tempting is it to get in your car after a race when you're on the the regular road and just fucking floor, like just fang it like you like you just been on the race is it is it hard to switch off i mean obviously you're not stupid so you're not going to be out there driving like an absolute maniac but 
is there just like habits or tendencies that you're just so used to doing that while you're driving just on the uh, normal public road that you just end I, up driving? I, I would, well, I wouldn't say necessarily anything silly. It's not like when we drive, we're like, oh, I've got to, you know, go 300K down this road <laughs> and you know, just be silly. But um, you know, for me, I hate inefficiency. So when someone's going below the speed limit, <laughs> for example, it really makes me angry or, you know, uh, I just don't like traffic. And I don't particularly enjoy driving on the roads. So, um, yeah, there's different elements to it. It's very different, though. It's a completely different environment, completely different car, um, completely different objective when you're in the car. So, it, yeah, it really separates it, I guess. But um, as you get older, too, when you're younger, you tend to be more stupid, do stupid things. You know, we've all yeah. had cars when we're young and trying to impress our mates. And, you know, <laughs> do but, um, yeah, generally now, it's, um, yeah, that's not really an issue. Well, how much, uh, how much, attention do you give to the mental side of things like whether it be meditation whether it be working with a sports psych or or even just visualize visualization and manifestation whatever it is yeah. and particularly pre-race and then maybe even after a bad race you know being able to get over the, the the shitty drive or whatever it may be and then move on to the next race do you put much attention to that um yeah 100 percent. that's a major major part of it so um it's something that i um you know i'm quite up and down, um, like a, a lot of sports people, I think, because you're quite hard on yourself, you're quite critical. Um, you know, I get, you know, quite upset or, you know, mad at, at certain things, you know, that you could have done better or, or whatever. But the mental side is huge. We don't really appreciate, um, you know, how big it is for a lot of things. So I work with a, um, a sports psychologist on that. So trying to, uh, the main thing is trying to control your emotional intensity level. So, um, we, we train that through using lights. So um, we have certain competitions we do and um, it's all about how I prepare myself for the sequence of events and how I react to how things work and we play through different situations and um, you can re after a while really tell how to um, tell how you're feeling on that day. Am I feeling today a bit anxious? Um, if so, what do I need to do to bring that back down? Do I need to listen to music? Do I need to meditate for a bit? Or on the other side, am I feeling a bit sleepy? Is my intensity level a bit lower? And do I need to do something to get that up? And normally that would involve doing a sequence of um, reaction lights that I, that I have or yep. um, doing some skipping, getting your heart rate up and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff that goes with that. And um, yeah, it's very, very mental. But before we get in the car, I, well, I have a, a sequence of things I do. Um, and one of them is bring my heart rate up um, for two minutes to about 150 beats per minute. Um, and then I do a sequence of reaction lights. And it's really interesting if you do the reaction lights first without doing anything, well, after you've just been sitting around for a while, and then you go do some skipping, you go on a bike or do whatever for your two minutes, then you come back. Uh, the difference is very noticeable on your reactions, how you're doing, your emotional intensity level, all that sort of stuff. So. Um, yeah, the, the, that side of it's pretty big. And um, as far as, you know, manifesting stuff and, and being positive, I think anyone that's a, a great sports person just naturally does that. You know, we all have the desire to do well. And when I lay in bed, you know, I'm not thinking about, you know, what, sh what shoe or what sunglasses I'm going to buy the next day. <laughs> I'm thinking about how I can bloody, you know, beat the next guy, or how I'm going to win a championship or win a race or, you know, be better um, at any stage. And I think that's, that's the attitude you've got to have. 100% man. And, and, you know, staying on that topic, what are, what are the ambitions um, for you? Like what's, what's the long-term goal? Is it to stay in the V8? Do so you have other ambitions as a race driver, like obviously to win a championship and, and continue to win races and stuff like that. But what's, um, what's the end goal for you? Um, and it, well, end goal for me is basically supercars. So supercars is the pinnacle of, I probably say um, Australasian motorsport. And it's one of the best touring car categories in the world. Well, it, 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 it is. So, um, as far as that goes, I think that's sort of where my career will be and will, will continue until it ends. Um, but, you know, I, I want to win. I'm not, I'm not going to be you know, happy. I, you know, I've gone through the whole progression. So when you're at the back, you're learning, you're, you're growing, you know, you start getting better results and you get happier and happier. But then now, like, you know, I can come inside the top five and, you know, I'm disappointed. I came fifth on the weekend and I was pretty pissed that I didn't come you know, higher. So yeah. it's one of those things. I think you're, you're never going to be happy, but the goal 100% is to win races and, you know, hopefully one day win a championship to sort of, you know, I think that's everyone, that's everyone's goal. 
Fantastic, mate. Well, very much uh, appreciate your time today, man, and good luck for the, the rest of the season. And I'll have all the links to your socials and your website and stuff in the show notes below, but we'll um, definitely keep up with your, your performances for the rest of the season, mate. So thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. No worries. Thanks, mate. Awesome, guys. And to everyone who's tuned in to today's episode, if you've enjoyed today's chat, please do take a screenshot of this episode, post up an Instagram story for me, tag myself, tag Andre. Like I said, his socials will be in the show notes below. Um, look forward to chatting to you again in the very next episode.